be led away and beheaded according to the laws. That's just what happened. And again, this is apparently from some court records from somewhere because these again have been authenticated. So, and that's how Justin Martyr became Justin the Martyr. All right. Uh, as I said before, the there uh, there are quite a group of ap apologist fathers, and we're we, the time we have today. If we're lucky, we're going to get through two of them. And so we're going to go from Justin Martyr to Irenaeus. And Irenaeus was uh, life lived from 115 to 202. Let's see if we can find him down here. Irenaeus, is, he's one of the Western fathers, so he's on the bottom. Justin Martyr was one of the Eastern fathers, so he's on the bottom. And yeah, that's about right. Uh, 115 to 202. Okay. Now, uh, tradition with a small t says Irenaeus was, and of course these, both these guys were saint, are saints. Saint Justin Martyr and Saint Irenaeus. Uh, uh, tradition has it, and again the small t, that, that Irenaeus was also martyred, but there's no actual record of that. It's only, one, it's only cited in one place, and uh, it was cited by somebody who wrote like 500 years afterwards, so it's not... It's not authenticated, so we really don't know. He was a pupil of Saint Polycarp, who we met as one of the Apostolic Fathers, okay, uh, and became Bishop of Lyon in what is now France, but was then called at age 37. Now Lyon is now France, but at the time it was a Greek-speaking city. Okay, he was born in Asia Minor probably in Smyrna, which is the modern day Turkey, but somehow ended up in Gaul. We're not really sure how he got there, but he got there. Uh, in between, he stopped in Rome and was a student of Justin Martyr in a school that, this, that Justin had established there. Uh, again, Gregory of Tours mentions him as a martyr some 500 years afterwards, but there was no evidence to support this. Now, Irenaeus was actively refuting the Gnostic heresy. Now, Gnostics. Heretics. The word comes from the Greek gnosis, which is knowledge. So, the Gnostics. Now, by the middle of the second century, the Roman Empire was pretty well played out. Roman society suffered from a sense of futility. Nobody took Roman polytheism very seriously anymore. In other words, the Roman gods were, yeah, that's nice mythology, but <laughs> what? Uh, looking to the east, because people had to have something to, to live by. Looking to the east, to Persia came a mishmash of Greek philosophy and some mysterious cults that brought forth an intoxicating brew known as Gnosticism. It was not a tightly organized religion in any sense, but a general way of thinking that characterized a wide variety of sects, S-E-C-T-S, that often disagreed in the details. So when we talk about Gnosticism, we're going to be talking in general terms, because not all the Gnostics believe the same thing. Not an organized religion, if you will. Now there were some basic ideas that the Gnostics held in common. And they all presented a grave threat to second century Christianity. Okay. They believed in a supreme being. He did not create the material world. Okay? Supreme being, completely spiritual, did not create the material world. The material world was created by something called the Demiurge. I'm going to write that. The Demiurge. 
demigod, if you want. Okay? Not quite a god, something less than a god. Okay. The demiurge created the miracle, the, the material world. And it was a world of darkness. Okay? Now, the supreme being came from a world of light. Demiurge from a world of darkness. Okay. Some Gnostics taught that the Demiurge was malevolent. Others that he was just incompetent. Okay. In any case, the material world was not the good world of Genesis. In other words, when God created, created the good world, created the world, he said it was good. Okay, the Gnostics said no, that wasn't good. It was a terrible mistake. Okay? Now the most tragic is that some sparks of divinity, some actual spirituality, manage to get trapped inside human bodies. Okay? This is what the demiurge is doing. All right? And redemption required that men discover the true spiritual identity, escape from their disgusting bodies and its passions, and return to their true heavenly home. That's how you got redemption. Such liberation required gnosis. Okay, required gnosis. The Greek word for knowledge. Some spiritual being had to descend from above, from the realms of light, and bring us this redeeming gnosis. Humanity was carnal and belonged to this realm of decay. The Savior did not come from such pitiful folk who were destined to everlasting destruction. So when the Savior did not come from humanity, the Savior came from up above and was purely spiritual. Where did we hear this before? Docentism, right? Where basically Jesus was just a spirit and the body was just an illusion. Okay. So these guys are saying the Savior who comes down from, from life. Okay? He is a purely spiritual being, has no body. Okay? So those few elite who were angels, okay, who were angels imprisoned in flesh, those few elites, okay, notice that we had the elites and the non elites people who would get saved, people who aren't going to get saved. You find that in some religions that are being taught today. Okay, there were the elect and the non-elect. 144,000 that are going to get saved and the rest that aren't going to get saved. So, but there's nothing new under the sun. Okay. The Savior would bring to these people liberating knowledge of their true origins and a complicated set of esoteric passwords. Okay. And back then they had computers. So that after death, these divine souls could navigate past the demiurge and find their way into the realm of light. So the Savior was coming. He had this special knowledge that he was going to impart to the elite. And the elite was going to get saved. Okay? And some Gnostics, hearing the words of St. John, the word... From, from chapter 1 of St. John, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Okay? Suppose that Jesus was this heavenly message, messenger bringing salvation. Taking a page from the Docetus, as I talked about before, the Gnostics held that Jesus only appeared to be human. Such a bearer of heavenly revelation could have no body, and therefore could not have died. Salvation, after all, was not accomplished through sacrifice, but only through knowledge. So salvation comes from this special knowledge. If you don't got the special knowledge, you don't get saved. Okay. Now, Gnosticism had its implications. Theirs was Christianity without a cross. Okay? The Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, and there, is, there were Gnostic Gospels written. The Gnostic Gospel of Thomas leaves out the crucifixion and passion entirely. And it's just a collection of wise sayings. 
Was okay. he an apostle? Who? That Thomas. Uh, yeah, he was. He was the apostle that they named. This, this, that he didn't have anything to do with it. Oh. Uh, just like you know, the the, the apostle of uh, the the gospel of Saint Peter. Peter didn't know anything about it. Okay. okay? So, uh, where was I? Okay, so the, the apostle, uh, the gospel of Thomas. Uh, if the body is just a hunk of meat and has no spiritual implications, then all matter of licentiousness is possible, right? So if you've got a body, and a body is evil anyway, right? Why not? Okay, so that left things wide open. That's pretty good. Okay. Now, how did the Gnostics claim that their vision of Christ was the true one? Easy. Jesus realized that the common Joe, you and I, couldn't handle the truth. Great from the movie, right? You guys can't handle the truth. And therefore, it could be only entrusted to the few elite. These confidants, Pass their secret tradition down from generation to generation. Okay? So if you have a special knowledge, you pass it down from generation to generation. You can see how things get out of hand. Who, who had the special knowledge? How did you know they had the special knowledge? Were they the right people or not? But they were also material, so they were bad. But they had the spiritual part in them. That was going to go but through the, gonna... You're going to go through, you know, the, the spiritual part was going to survive the body and go into the realm of life. Meanwhile, the body can do anything it wanted. It's a, it's a pretty good religion when you come right back. <laughs> <laughs> so. right. Now, somehow, somehow, this strange heresy, and you got to admit it's pretty strange, spread throughout the Roman Empire. Well, no, okay. because they were pagans, and they were accepting that. So, okay, yeah, sure. we have to give up this, but we can still believe this. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. You can see that. Now, <laughs> meanwhile, you get Leon, in, in Leon, Irenaeus, excuse me, Irenaeus was saying, we can't let this happen. We can't let this stuff go on. And I'm going to attack this heresy straight on. So he figured that he could just lay this, if he could just lay this pro, this preposterous fantasy side by side with the Gospels, he he could win the battle against not you know against Nazism going away. Five volumes later, <laughs> around 185 A.D., he published Against Heresies. Uh, now, Irenaeus didn't choose a sola scriptura, that is, only scripture argument, because it wouldn't have worked. Uh, one of the contested issues was precisely which of the Christian scriptures were authentic, because there was a whole bulk of work out there of Gnostic scriptures, of which the Gospel of Thomas is just one. Okay? So there was a whole bunch of Gnostic Gospels out there, Gnostic writings. And the Gnostics would take the real Gospels, and take out what they wanted and insert other stuff in the middle to, to justify what they did and publish them as their, you know, as the authentic back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So there was a whole bunch of stuff on scriptures and nobody knew which was authentic and which ones weren't. So Justin couldn't very easily use the scriptures as, as defense. Instead he used common sense. If Jesus had secret Deeper knowledge to pass down, who would he be entrusted it to? The apostles. Okay? He selected them personally. Okay? So if there was any special knowledge going around, it would have been the, it would have rested in the apostles. At the end of their lives, the apostles' lives, that particular knowledge would have been given to their chosen successors, the bishops. Okay? And so on. Irenaeus argued that the Catholic bishops of apostolic cities, such as Ephesus, Ephesus, Corinth, and Rome, okay, which were three of the seven churches that were established through Paul, if you remember, and the seven churches that are addressed in Revelation, okay, uh, they could all trace their lineage back to the apostles. 
me say that again. Irenaeus argued that the, the Catholic bishops of apostolic cities could all trace their lineage back to the apostles. And since they knew nothing of the silly doctrines of Gnosticism, it proves that they could not possibly come from Jesus and his followers. Okay. Uh, another good book, Faith in the Early Fathers, uh, it comes in three volumes, and I'm, I'm just getting through volume one. And I've been working at it for a couple of years because I'm getting a little bit of time. But uh, this is the authentic, basically the writings of the Fathers of the Church, and this only gives that excerpts. So you can imagine how, how vast the writings are. So three volumes aren't going to cover all the writings of the doctrines of the Church. In any case, uh, Let me read directly from Against Heresies by St. Irenaeus. It is possible then for, for everyone in every church who may wish to know the truth to complicate, to contemplate the tradition of the apostles which has been made known throughout the whole world. And we are in a position to enumerate those who were instituted bishops by the apostles and their successors in their own times. Men who neither knew or taught anything like what these heretics rave about. For it is the apostles, for if the apostles had known hidden mysteries, which they taught to the elite secretly and apart from the rest, they would have handed them down especially to those very ones to whom they were committing the self-same churches. For surely they wished all those and their successors to be perfect and without reproach to whom they handed up on their authority. In other words, if there had been some sort of secret knowledge, the bishops didn't know it. Because that was handed, everything that the apostles taught was handed down to the bishops. Okay. Irenaeus uses specific examples from the Roman church, tracing the Pope of his day back to Peter naming every pope in between. And in proclaiming the doctrine of apostolic succession of teaching offices, it also provided the key to deciding which were true and authentic specific writings. Apostolic writings, if you will. Simply put, those gospels and epistles which are authentic have been in continuous use in the churches founded by the apostles. All right? These writings are authentic. They've been, out, they've been used in the churches, the, the seven churches that were established at the time. They would have been, they would have been used in the churches from the very beginning. Uh, I'm going to go back to Ambro Ambrosio for, for a quote of Irenaeus. I like a lot of time. Okay, we ought to love with the greatest zeal the things of the church, and so to lay hold of the tradition of the truth. Am I in the right place? Yeah, okay. What if there should be a dispute about some matter of moderate importance? Should we not turn to the oldest churches where the apostles themselves were known, and find out from them the clear and certain answer to the problems now being raised? Even if the apostles had not left their writings to us, but we not follow the rule of the tradition which they handed down to those to whom they committed the churches? What did he just say? He said, you know, if there was some sort of special stuff going on, the churches would know about it because it would have been passed down to them. And they don't know anything about this stuff. Okay. He goes on to expound the true teaching of the material world, which is a blessing, not a curse, and the Savior who truly becomes one of us, the Incarnation, so that he can truly die for us. 
and the Savior continues to nourish us still through and in the sacraments, material realities that are transmitters of holiness. All right, so the true Savior uses the material world for good. In the face of Gnostic scorn for the material world, Irenaeus describes how the creation, incarnation, Eucharist, and resurrection of the body are inextricably intertwined. Again, quote, they say, they get talking about the Gnostics, Irenaeus says, they say that the flesh, which is nourished with the body and blood of the Lord and with his blood, goes to corruption and does not partake of life. But our opinion is in accordance with the Eucharist, and the Eucharist in turn establishes our opinion. For we offer to him his own, announcing consistently the fellowship and union of the flesh and the spirit. For the flesh, for the bread, for the, as the bread which is produced from the earth, when it receives the invocation of God, is no longer common bread, but the Eucharist, consisting of two realities, earthly and heavenly. And so also our bodies, when they receive the Eucharist, are no longer corruptible, having the hope of resurrection to eternity. That's beautiful. And he, he, he nails it right there. Okay? So, resurrection of the body, the Eucharist, the Incarnation, they're all one thread of truth. Irenaeus goes on to expound on Jesus and how the new is the new Adam, and that Mary is the new Eve. Adam failed the human race by raising his hand to a tree in disobedience and in pride. Jesus lifted his hand to a tree as well in obedience, love, and humility. And thus started the human race anew, becoming the head of a new humanity. So Jesus undid the bondage of Satan, forged by Adam's disobedience, and becomes the new Adam. Likewise, Mary becomes the new Eve. Speaking of the Virgin Mary, Irenaeus declares, and thus, as the human race fell into bondage to death by means of a virgin, so it is rescued by a virgin, virginal disobedience having been balanced on the opposite scale by virginal obedience. So Mary is the new Eve. Well, not long after Irenaeus' book came out, Gnosticism became an afterthought. In fact, the only reason we have a uh, copy of the Apostle of the, of the uh, Gospel of Thomas is because a version of it or a, or a record of it written down happened to get lost in the Egyptian desert and managed to survive over time. The only reason we have it. Otherwise, it's the only Gnostic writing we have left. Yes? Okay, so Thomas did believe in, in that thing that... No, no. no. They just, they just used his name. They just used his name. Okay, it's like they, there was a Gospel of Peter. Okay. And Peter never wrote it, didn't have anything to do with it. It was called the Gospel of Peter. Oh. All right? And there were lots of epistles out there. It was supposedly written by Paul or written by, you know, one of the, one of the saints. Okay. No. Okay? They just used the name in order to get the authenticity. Okay. That's all. So no, St. Thomas has nothing to do with the Gospel oh. of Thomas. Okay? And that's about all we have time for. And I, I, didn't think we, I didn't think we were going to... Uh, I, get through any of the rest of the apostolic uh, or the apologist fathers. But you can see who they are. Um, they are in this book. If you want to learn a little bit more about them, you want to learn a little bit more about Justin Martyr and Irenaeus, they're in this book as well. Who's the author again? Uh, Marcellino D'Ambrosio. No, what's the title? The title is When the Church Was Young. Okay, When the Church Was Young. And I can say it's a pretty easy read. We, we, the Wednesday morning men's group did this whole book uh, on the Apostolic Fathers. It was really excellent because it was a really good series. So, okay, are there any questions? <laughs> we covered a lot of material. I know. Yeah, it's awesome. There's yeah. a whole lot that's very interesting. Yeah, this this is good stuff. I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah. So the Nicodemus, that the study that Deacon David's going to do during this time. Next week. 
That starts not 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 next week. Not 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 next week, next week but, right? But right the week after week. Easter. Yeah, we, they're meeting in the same room here, here. and they're, they're going to be meeting with us, and we're going to go through uh, the uh, the DVD series called um, Forgiven. Okay, so we don't need a book. It's not a book. No, you don't okay. need a book. Okay. Uh, and it's an excellent, excellent series. Again, we did that with the Wednesday morning men's group, and it was just, it was just phenomenal. It did a beautiful job. And there isn't just one speaker. They have a whole bunch of different speakers, and they, okay. they, they talk about reconciliation, and they talk about forgiveness, and so forth. And, mm -hmm. and basically, uh, if you don't take the words of the Lord's Prayer to heart, you know, that, you know, who forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, you're in big trouble. <laughs> that's, that's basically what the whole message is that forgiveness is, is a requisite for salvation. And it's really very, very good. I thoroughly recommend it. I would say don't miss it, of course, these days will be here anyway. So. And how many weeks does that take? That's a six week, six week uh, operation. And we've got, I've got them scheduled for those six weeks. So. So it'll be right, it'll take us right up until yeah, yeah, yeah. almost to the end of our summer season. Yeah. I may so so okay, well, unfortunately, it isn't going to be on yeah, DVD. I, I mean, it isn't going to be on, on the uh, video <laughs> because it's a DVD. But uh, the DVDs are available if you want to get them. It's on, remember that we all signed up for Focus. Right. Oh. Okay. And those, that particular DVD is from the, from the Augustinian. Group. And so you can you can go right to it and get it. Okay. I mean, you, you, can, you can see it. You can see you know watch it on on, on focus. Okay. Let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was very